the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series today. Um, my name is Ron Duncan Hart, and it's my pleasure to welcome today with us Dr. Tariq Abu Hamid from the Arava Institute. And um, before we start, I would like to thank the, those of you, the donors who underwrite these programs and make them possible, and particularly to the underwriter today, Dr. Doris Francis, um, who is underwriting this program in the memory of Luis Erhard. Um, I would also like to recognize um, Gloria Bellavallon and Bonnie Ellinger, who work on the program committee and help make these programs possible. So it is, is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Tariq Abu Hamid, who holds a PhD in chemical engineering from the Ankara University, and later did postdoctoral research at the Weizmann Institute in, of Science in Israel, and also at the University of Minnesota, which seems like the other end of the world, but uh, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that. Um, Dr. Abu Hamid has published extensively and has been recognized with uh, several awards, including the Dan David Prize. Um, he previously served as a director of engineering research for I Israel's Ministry of Science, Technology, and Space. He is currently the executive director of the Arava Institute as he continues his own research at the Dead Sea and Arava Science Center. Um, the Arava Institute is one of the most important institutions in the Middle East, and I think in a, in a major way, a world leader in looking at sustainability and issues of water, climate, uh, agriculture, and um, the, the work that you're doing there is, is so valuable that it's an honor that we can look at it today and you can bring this information to, to our audience. And um, so Dr. Abu Hamid, Welcome. Thank you for being here in at the Santa Fe <clears throat> Lecture Series. Thank you so much, uh, Ron. It's really a great pleasure and an honor to be with you this morning or this uh, this evening here in uh, in Israel. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the Institute for Tolerance Studies also to for organizing such a, an important series and giving me the opportunity to give you like a small taste of what the Arava Institute is and what uh, we do in this part of the of the world. Okay, here we go. The Arava Institute is an academic and research institution. And our mission is to advance cross-border environmental cooperation in the face of the political conflict. We cannot allow the political conflict to prevent us from dealing with the environmental challenges that are facing this part of the of the world. What is lacking in the in the Middle East? We have plenty of peace treaties between Israel and neighbors, Jordan, Palestine, Egypt, and lately the Abraham Accords. So we don't lack peace treaties, and we have actually the natural resources that we need, especially the sun. Here in Israel, we receive one of the highest solar radiations in the world, and if we can utilize this source of energy, this renewable source of uh, energy, we can produce the electricity that is needed to desalinate our water, to treat the wastewater, and to produce our food. So we have the right technologies actually here in the, in the Middle East. What's lacking in the Middle East is trust. And the lack of trust actually prevents us from working with each other, from cooperating on environmental issues and also security issues. And this is what we try to do at the Arava Institute. Use environmental studies, use climate change as a diplomacy tool to connect between the people of the region, to deal with environmental challenges and also to build a trust to deal properly with the environmental challenges that we have in the, in the region. We have an academic program, as I said, and one third of our students are Arabic speaker students, Palestinians from both West Bank and Gaza, 
Israeli Arabs, Jordanians, Moroccans, Sudanese, and we have one third international students, mainly from North America, and one third Jewish Israeli students. Students come to the Araba Institute for one semester or two. We don't grant university degree. It's a university level semester accredited by Ben Gurion University of the of the Negev, and also Bennington College in in Vermont. Students come spend the semester, take the transcript, and they go back to their universities. And I'm very proud to say that the Arava Institute is the gate for the Arab students from the neighboring countries to come and study in Israel. The vast majority of Palestinians and Jordanians who are conducting or already conducted their graduate studies in Israel came to Israel through the Arava Institute. The first Jordanian who got a PhD from Israel was an alum of the Arava Institute. And here we use, again, we use the academic program to bring these students to, uh, together to help them build, build bridges. It's not easy to put in the same classroom a Palestinian from a refugee camp with an Israeli student who just finished his army service. And when we talk about environmental challenges, when we talk about water issues, water rights, politics always arise. And always we have hot discussions between, between the students. And in order to have a healthy academic program, we designed what we call the peace building seminar and the dialogue forum, where students discuss everything, culture, religion, politics, they share family stories, personal stories, Palestinians share their experience living in a refugee camp, Israeli students share their experience serving in the, in the army. And you can imagine these discussions are not easy. They are always warm, they shout, they cry. But the Arava Institute is located, as you said, Ron, in the beginning, it's in the middle of nowhere. In southern Israel, in the tip of the, of the country, so they have no place to go. It's a kibbutz in the middle of the desert. Students go to the same classroom, to the same dining room, and at the end of the day, they share rooms in the dormitories that we have. That means they live with each other for full academic semester, three or four months. And that's how they build understanding, how that they build acceptance of the, of the other. During the seminar, we have what we call the multi-narrative trip, where we take all the students to Jerusalem. They see settlements, they see east part of the city, the western part of the, of the city. They meet people from the right wing, from the left wing in Israel and also in, in Palestine. And we, talk all, we take them also to the Holocaust Museum, to Yad, to Yad Vashem. And in one of these trips to, uh, to Yad Vashem, we had students from Gaza. And we had also an Israeli student. And she tells the Gazan student, you know what? I did my civil service here in this museum as a tour guide. Let me give you this tour. This is an Israeli woman telling a Palestinian from, from Gaza. She gives him the tour and toward the end of the tour, he looks at her and she says, you know what? Now I understand why you Jewish people needed the state. To hear such a statement from a Palestinian, from a Gazan who never left Gaza, and the first time he left Gaza, he comes to the Arava Institute. It was very powerful for every one of us. These are the results of our program to build understandings. He says, I understand. Maybe he disagrees, but he understands. And that's what we need here in this region. We need to bring people together to build understanding, actually to give them the opportunity to meet, build understanding and, and trust. And once these young kids see the human, in the other, that's the game changer. That's how they become one community, one family. They build understanding and they build the trust and they continue their partnership in the, in the future. We also have an internship program at the Arava Institute where interns come and do research in one of the research centers that we, that we have. So they help us also in doing research and conducting projects on the, on the ground. Again, also we are 
as I said, an academic and research institution, and we have several research centers at the Arava Institute, centers that deal with clean energy sources, renewable energies, water management, sustainable agriculture, arid social ecology, and we also have the Regional Climate Change Research Center. This is a photo of our expansion of the of the campus, the planned expansion of the of the campus, as you see here in the in the map, we are located probably 30 miles from the Gulf of Ilat and and Aqaba. We are located 30 miles from Aqaba, Jordan, 32 miles from Taba in Egypt, and 40 miles from Saudi Arabia. And we are half an hour flight to Tel Aviv. And we have 25 years of experience in conducting transboundary research. Most of the research that we do has a transboundary aspect. What does that mean? It means we deal with environmental challenges that are shared between Israel and its neighbors, with the Palestinians, with the, with the, with the Jordanians. We have projects in Jordan. We have projects in the West Bank. We have projects in, uh, in Gaza. And I will elaborate more on that. That's why we decided to establish such an important center, the Regional Center for Climate, climate Change, in order to allow all researchers from the whole region, not just the, the immediate neighbors of, uh, of Israel, no, from Saudi Arabia, from the Emirates, from Bahrain, from Morocco, to come and do research with us in issues that are related to, to climate change. Why we decided to establish this center? Because the Middle East is considered as a hot spot when it comes to, to climate change. We expect <clears throat> the temperature to rise significantly. The increase in air temperature is above the global average by 1.54 centigrade. The acidity of the ocean is increasing in the Eastern Mediterranean. What does that mean? We have a lot of invasive species now in the, in the sea that they come, they migrate from the Red Sea towards the Eastern Mediterranean. The sea, is, the sea level is expected to rise by meters, not centimeters. And we know if we continue business as usual here in this part of the, of the world, for example, the, the, the delta in the, in the Nile in Egypt would be underwater in like two, three decades. And this region in Egypt, the delta, is a home of tens of millions of people who live on agricultural activities. What will happen to these people? Will they become climate migrants? It will cause also a security, security challenge. So climate change is not only an environmental issue, but also a first degree security issue. And one country alone cannot deal with climate change. We have to work with each other, to cooperate with each other, to solve or to help and prepare the communities in this region to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of, of the climate change. If we continue business as usual, people will leave their land, will leave their, their, their daily businesses, and mainly it's agriculture. They will migrate to cities, and that will create instability in these cities. And we don't like instability. So we have to deal with the climate change else actually to stabilize the region that we, that we live in. We decided also to have this research center because look to this map. The blue color that you see here, the light blue color, this is the aquifer between Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. It's all shared. The coastal aquifer is shared between Israel and Gaza. The mountain aquifer is shared between the West Bank, Jordan, and Israel. The Jordan Valley aquifer is shared between Israel and Jordan. The Arava aquifer that's here in the, in the Arava is shared between Israel and, and Jordan. So it doesn't matter where the pollution starts, it's, it impacts every one of us. That's why at the Arava Institute, we do this transboundary environmental, environmental work. And again, in order to do that, in order to find a partner, you have to build the trust. And that's, that's, that's our expertise actually, building trust with our neighbors. And that's what allows us to deal with these important environmental challenges of the, of the region to have a better air quality, to have a better water, clean water, and to help our neighbors also to use the right technologies to, to produce water, to treat the wastewater and reuse it for agricultural activities, to prevent the aquifer pollution. 
We also at the Arava Institute established what we call the track two environmental forum. Track one is governmental level. Track two is the civil society organizations. And the goal of this, this center is to engage governmental officers or officials in being part of the environmental solution that we that we are seeking and to develop networks of scientists, practitioners, students, emerging leaders, community leaders, because we want people on the ground, not only governmental officials. We want the farmer, we want the student, we want the woman, we want the farmers co cooperative to feel the benefit of the work that we do at the Arava Institute. That's why we work with researchers, with students, with governmental officials, and with regular people, with farmers, with community leaders, with municipalities, with regional, with regional councils, because again, we want to build to build the trust. I'll give you here some examples of the of the projects that we implement in the region. This project here, we call it the water gen in, in Gaza. Gaza suffers from the lack of electricity, and the lack of electricity prevents them from treating the wastewater. Untreatment of the of the wastewater causes the pollution of the of the aquifer because they don't treat the wastewater; they just dump it into the fields or to the sea, and that pollutes the shared aquifer. And the aquifer is in Gaza. Almost ninety-seven percent of the groundwater in Gaza is not good for human consumption. And we at the Arava Institute as an Israeli organization, we were able to send into Gaza seven systems. It's an Israeli technology that generates drinking water from air. It's similar to the air condition, but it generates water. And these systems are off the grid. They use solar energy and batteries and they run 24 seven. Last, <clears throat> these are the examples of the of the systems that we managed to send into Gaza. It's an Israeli technology. We did not develop it at the Arava Institute. Our role was to facilitate between the Israeli army and our Palestinian partners in uh, in Gaza managed to do the facilitation through the Palestinian Authority there. We are a non-governmental organization and we work with non-governmental organizations. And this is how we do the work. We don't work with the governments, we work with non-governmental organizations. And this how this helps us a lot in conducting projects in the in the region. Last year during the war, we've been in touch with our Gazan partners, asking them about these projects. Are they functioning? Are they producing water? Did anything happen to them? They said, look, we cannot reach them. It's it's a war, roads blocked, it's unsafe. The war ended on Erev Shabbat Friday evening. Saturday morning, we received photos of people filling water from these from these systems. These systems were the only systems generating drinking water for the Gazan people during the war. And that was a great exposure for this technology in Gaza. Monday morning, like two days after the war ended, we received five requests from five different municipalities in Gaza asking for such systems. The success is not to send the system to Gaza. It's not only that. The success is to be in touch with our Palestinian partners as an Israeli organization, even during the toughest time of the year, during the war. That is the success in my, in my opinion. And we managed to do that, to keep that communication channel open, even under the extreme conditions of this, of this region. We managed to send also into Gaza an off-grid wastewater treatment plant. Again, lack of electricity prevents them from treating the wastewater. And we managed to send them an off-grid system that treats the water in a certain part of, of Gaza. And the treated wastewater is used by a group of women to grow animal feed that creates jobs for them and creates income. And we do that in full coordination with the Israeli authorities. We receive permits from the Israeli army to do, these, to do these projects. And here you can see the photos of the off-grid wastewater treatment plant crossing from Israel into Gaza, the construction, the plant, and the plant is now operational. It treats the wastewater, helps people to have 
high quality water for agriculture, prevents the wastewater from infiltrating into the aquifer or being dumped into the Eastern Mediterranean. And by the way, when Gazans dump the wastewater into the Eastern Mediterranean, the wastewater doesn't stay in Gaza borders. The streams in the Eastern Mediterranean are south-north. That means they, the waves take the wastewater toward Ashkelon, which is a city northern of Gaza Strip. And Ashkelon is a home of one of the largest desalination plants in the world. And if you have organic waste, if you have wastewater in the seawater, you cannot desalinate it. That's why the desalination unit in Ashkelon had to close several times, probably in the last three or four years. Every year, three or four times they close the plant because of the pollution that comes from Gaza. That means millions of shekels every day that this plant is closed. And that shows us that pollution starts in Gaza, doesn't stay in Gaza. It impacts our, it impacts the, their neighbors, it impacts Israel. That's why we do these projects with our with our partners. Another project that we have, it's in the in the West Bank. They <clears throat> here in the in the map, you see there's a green line and also a red line. The green line, the tip, I don't know if you see my mouse. But the tip of the of the green line here, this is a city called Albire, which is probably like seven, eight miles from Jerusalem. And they have high quality wastewater treatment plant that treats the wastewater for Albire, Ramallah, and the Jewish neighborhoods there. Treats the wastewater and the treated wastewater, which is high quality, good for agriculture, flows in the valley. No one is using that because it's in area C. So the inlet of the wastewater is the wastewater treatment plant is in area A, area A, and the outlet is in area C. Area A means this is the division that happened in Oslo Accords. Oslo, Accord, Oslo, Oslo Agreement divides the West Bank into three, three parts. Area A, which is under full Palestinian control from the civil control and also the security. Area B, the civil control is with the Palestinians, the security control is with the Israelis. Area C is fully controlled by, by Israel. So the Palestinians can control the outlet, the inlet, they can't control the outlet. And this high quality water just flows in the in the valley. The Palestinians cannot, cannot use it. It flows and it comes to area called Mikmas, and here it mixes with untreated wastewater that comes from the northern parts of Jerusalem. Jerusalem municipality, and both become polluted. So all efforts that have been made upstream in the wastewater treatment plant, they got lost because the, the treated water mixes with untreated wastewater and both of them become polluted and flows toward the, the Dead Sea, pollutes the aquifer and pollutes the natural spring. And for those who know this area here, this is, a touristic area. It's called Wadil Wadil Kilt. It has natural springs and has also value for not only the, the the Christians but also the Muslims in the in the region. The Arava Institute managed to do the facilitation as an Israeli organization. We talked to the civil administration, which is the, the Israeli army, and our Palestinian partners talked to the Palestinian Water Authority. This project was a priority for the Palestinians because they want to use the water, use it for agricultural reasons, but they cannot because it flows in area C. For the Israelis, it's a priority because it pollutes the aquifer. And the Israeli water company had to close two wells in that region because of the pollution. But because the Palestinians and the Israelis don't talk to each other, this project was stuck since 1996. So before four years, we, our one of our researchers said, I want to take this project and deal, deal with it. And we managed after four years to bring the Palestinians and the Israelis to agree on a route that will take the treated wastewater from Albire toward the Jordan Valley. And we managed to get a, build, a building permission granted by the Israeli army to the Palestinian Water Authority to build a pipeline that will take the water from Albire to Jordan, the, to Jericho, to be used by the Palestinian farmers. We are talking here about like almost like 200 
sorry, 2 million cubic meters of water, which is good for agriculture. So here we are solving an environmental issue and also we're providing the farmers with the water that they need to keep their agricultural activities. Here is the photo of the Palestinian and the Israeli team. It took us four years to take this photo, to bring the two teams, two teams together to decide on the uh, engineering plan. We, the Arava Institute, with actually very generous support of uh, the Friends of the Arava Institute in, uh, in Boston, uh, managed to raise funds and we covered the whole cost of the engineering design of the, of the, water, uh, of the water line. And now the Palestinians are fundraising to build the project itself, which will cost them around $2 million, uh, 20 million, $20 million. But that will impact the, the, the life of hundreds of families in the, in the Jordan Valley. Another project that we have, again, it's an off-grid wastewater treatment plant. We call it Laguna, uh, Laguna Tech. It's a system that we developed here at the Arava Institute. It's an off-grid wastewater treatment plant. Most of the villages in, in uh, the West Bank, they are not connected to the sewage network. So what, what houses do, they, they have what we call septic tanks and they store the wastewater there. And these septic tanks are not very well insulated, which means that the wastewater infiltrates into the shared aquifer between Israel and the West Bank. So this technology helps houses, helps people to treat their wastewater off grid, not connected to the sewage network, not connected to the electricity. It treats the wastewater, it's modular, it's scalable. It can treat the wastewater for a home, for a village, for, for a school. And that helps farmers, again, to have recycled water for the agricultural activities. We managed to install this in the northern parts of the West Bank, in the Jordan Valley, in the Bedouin communities in the, in the Negev. Here, our, the expansion of the Arava Institute campus will use this technology to treat the wastewater for the dormitories of the, of the students. We also have off-grid desalination systems that we develop at the Arava Institute and we install them around the, around the region, in the Negev, in the, in the West Bank, and also in, uh, in Gaza. We do also work, again, look, when, when, when I say the research institution, we do, we do pure scientific research and we do applied research. And we do work with the communities, again, because as I said, we want to have an impact in the, in the region. And this is one of the actually <clears throat> great projects that we have in cooperation with Oxford University, that we develop a model of the natural resources of this, of this region how these natural resources will look like in 2030, in 2050, under two scenarios. One, business as usual, countries don't cooperate with each other, or what will happen to these natural resources if countries cooperate with each other? And the preliminary results of the, of the model shows that this region can save hundreds, tens, tens of billions of dollars every year if Jordan, Israel, Palestine cooperate with each other on their natural resources. When I say natural resources, I mean, I mean the water, energy, food, food nexus. When they plan these natural resources together, when they take into consideration the regional, the regional cooperation. And this will be my last example of the, of the projects that we, that we have. Look, you, you know Israel, Israel is a small country and we have a limited amount of, uh, of land. And we need to decide to use this land for agriculture or for energy production. And here at the Arava Institute, which is a joint project between the Dead Sea Arava uh, Science Center, the Jewish National Fund, the University of Arizona, through the joint, the CASA Joint uh, Institute, we came with this pilot. We call it the dual use of land. And I call it actually harvesting the sun twice to do agriculture under photovoltaic panels, under the solar panels or to equip the greenhouses that we use for agriculture with solar panels. So farmers will continue doing their farming activities and they will have a new crop, which is called the electricity and they generate income for them and help them 
to stabilize their, their income. So this is a photo of the first pilot in the Middle East, agri photovoltaic, and we managed to grow several uh, crops without seeing any any differences, which which is a very good uh, very good result. And currently, we are studying the impact of shading on water conservation, on the evaporation of the of the water, in the microclimate that generated under the photovoltaic uh, panels, in the soil uh, soil structure. And we also study the impact of agriculture in the performance of photovoltaic panels. And this helps us, again, to use the same land for food production and for electricity production. And it's a perfect solution, especially for desert regions, for rural areas, where farmers can produce electricity and use that electricity maybe to pump water from the, from the aquifer or to desalinate water. Here in the Middle East, especially in the desert regions, the aquifer is saline aquifer, salty, and that prevents farmers from growing whatever they want. It lim limits them from growing several crops, so they are limited. And when they have fresh water by desalination using the electricity that is generated on the farm, they can diversify their, their crops. They can introduce new crops to the, to the desert. And this is what we try to do here at the, at the Aravana Institute, to try to find innovative solutions to help people to adapt and to mitigate climate change while building, building trust, which is the most scarce resource here in this, in this region. And I'll stop here and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions if you, if you have. Hey, Tariq, thank you. Um, this is, uh, I, I was ready for more to go on. It's its fascinating to hear the story. And uh, having heard it before, but it, it it's always fascinating to see the new things that you're introducing. You know, um, the the peace building leadership seminar that you mentioned, uh, seems like such a, a critical part of your process. Uh, we, were, we were able to see now in the slides, um, the, the science, uh, the technology. Um, the, on an average semester, you have uh, something in the range of 50 students and interns? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, we have a capacity for 60 students, yeah. And this semester, we have around 55 from 10 countries. Yes, um, and and I, I saw on the list that you, there are people from not only, well, um, Israel, the Palestinian area, Jordan, Gaza, Morocco, um, but there are people Sudan, from Sudan, Germany, Netherlands, the U.S., Canada. Yeah, wide ranging group of students. So, you mentioned this this peace building seminar which is the point um, in another conversation you'd mentioned that, you know, when there are problems, uh, the, the military problems, you know, the, the war is going on or there is um, there are attacks back and forth, um, that one of the key things, you bring the students together and they address those issues. Could, could you talk about that? Yes, this is actually... The, our goal is is really to build a community that uh, talk about everything that uh, that happens, and we we talk about the elephant in the room. We talk about the the conflict, and the results of this peace building seminar or the dialogue forum that we have, actually we, we see it when something happens in this in this region. When a conflict rises, when there is a terror attack or a war or a, anything in the in the West Bank between the Palestinians and the, the Israelis, the first thing the students do to come together, to meet and to discuss it. They say, look, we live here together. If something happened in the in the north, and we cannot we cannot ignore it. And they discuss, they talk, look, they 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 disagree with each other, but at least they put the situation on the table and they they discuss it 
and they have very healthy, very mature discussion. That's the only way you can run a healthy academic program. And they build this kind of understanding. They see they, you see them after they graduate, they go visit each other in, in the West Bank, in Jordan. Uh, we have an alumni network and we have annual conference for our uh, alumni. We have alumni coordinators in the in the whole region, in the US, in Israel, in Jordan, in, in Palestine, that they keep in touch with the with our alumni community. Uh, our conference uh, takes place once in Israel, once in Jordan, once in uh, in Palestine, and hundreds of alumni come to uh, come together. We managed also to have small funding to encourage them to submit projects together, to establish startups together, Palestinians, Israelis, Israelis, Jordanians, to create that community of environmental ambassadors, community of you know, it's like the, these these young kids become engineers, become uh, professors. And by the way, we have professors in Jordan, Israel, Palestine, that they are graduates of the Arava Institute. And they, one alum doesn't stay one, one alum. They impact hundreds of people when they go back to their, uh, to their communities. And the understanding that they managed to, uh, to build uh, actually changes the way they the way they behave and they behave. It's really powerful to see how these young kids change their perspective and then change their uh, behavior. At the beginning of the semester, you see three groups: Arabs, Jewish Israelis, and internationals. And within a week, you cannot tell who is who, and that's very powerful. And that's what we do here at the at the institute, we need a, we need a generation that doesn't ignore the conflict. No, it talks about the conflict, but builds a trust to deal with the challenges that we have in the region. I think it's fascinating that you, um, for the many years that the Arrow Institute has been functioning, over time you have built up a network within the region um, of people who are working. Maybe some of them in the government, but others in the private sector outside of the government. Um, and you have this network of collaboration going on between Jordan, Palestine Authority, Israel. Um, we you know we uh, here in the United States, we hear about the problems in Gaza, but uh, you're there. You know, you're helping exactly get drinking water. Um, could you talk something about this network uh, that that has been produced over the years, the the professors, the engineers, the teachers? Uh, I, yeah. I, I can imagine kind of a growing network of collaboration. You, how does that work? Yeah, look, we, we have in this region more than eighteen hundred alumni. Most of them, and we we keep in touch with almost all of them. Uh, and most of them stay in the environmental field. They work in the government, in the private sector. They establish their own startups and, and companies. There are several renewable energy companies established in, in the West Bank and also in Gaza by the alumni of the Arava Institute. There are several non-governmental organizations in Israel, Jordan, Palestine, that they established by the alumni of the Arava Institute. Professors, as I uh, as I said, uh, advisors to parliament members in uh, in Jordan, in uh, in Israel, alumni of the Arava Institute, and we have partners now on the ground. We have professors that we work with that they are alumni of the Arava Institute. Three or at least I think four four of our faculty members are alumni of the Arava Institute. We have three board members of the Arava Institute that are alumni of the. Of the uh, of the Arava, these are our alumni uh, network, and we have also a network of uh, partners that we work with them on uh, on research, and they <clears throat> they trust us. We, as I said, we we keep the communication channel open even during the toughest time of the uh, of the year. You know, the Arava Institute. Uh, talking about the the teachers, professors that. Uh, form this network, um, reaches to Santa Fe. Uh, Charlie Schultz from the Santa Fe Community College 
was um, at the Institute and uh, was there as, as an intern um, and had brought the story of the Arava back to Santa Fe. Um, and the Santa Fe Community, Co Community College here has a, a, a well-developed um, sustainable agriculture uh, water recycling program um, that is um, so with the, in the American Southwest, of course, you had the connection with Arizona. In the American Southwest, um, we have some of the similar conditions, of course, uh, the aridity, light water, uh, agricultural issues. Uh, so it's it's interesting that there is even after, even to the American Southwest, the Aravai Institute is reaching. You know. Yes, indeed. Look, the, this is we, we live in like semi semi arid region uh, where lacks the enough uh, waterfall, and the technologies that we develop here actually helps people generate water, desalinate uh, water that they need for to keep again their daily uh, activities. One of the main challenges of this region, again, as I said, it's like the climate uh, migration, uh, which is like local migration within uh, within a country or international uh, migration. And if we continue business as usual, we will face tens of millions of refugees in this uh, in this region. The instability will uh, will increase. The reliance on on each other uh, because we have a similar climate. Israel with its uh, with its neighbors, and the threats are the same, and the interests are uh, common. So uh, these technologies actually help us stabilize the the region that we uh, that we live in. What you're doing there in terms of water conservation and desalinization is amazing, because you're you're far ahead of the United States in in those respects. Um, and we just have to congratulate you on, on that incredible work that is going on. You know, there, um, you mentioned at one point, the, the friends of the Ottawa Institute, um, you have a support network. The Ottawa is, is a, a nonprofit, non-governmental organization, and, um, you function, um, with the support from donors. Yes. We actually uh, rely on our friends of the Arava Institute. They are located in uh, in Boston. They raise the fundings for uh, for us, and I'm very glad to see some of our uh, board members here on this uh, uh, on this call. The donations that we get through the Arab the, the friends of the Arava Institute are tax uh, deductible, uh, uh, 501c in the uh, in the US, two thirds of our budget comes from the from the United States and one third comes from Israel, not from the Israeli government, but from research foundations uh, to do our, uh, our research. We do not receive any funding from the Israeli government for our academic program. We receive some funding for the scientific research that we do as any other Israeli uh, university. It's a, it's a challenging time uh, in this uh, in this region, and so some uh, questions related also to uh, to that. But uh, the work that the Arava Institute is what well, the work that we are doing now is is very critical, especially in this critical uh, critical time. Uh, as an institution that people see it as uh, as the whole that brings people uh, people together our work uh, is impacted by what's happening in the in the region and the judicial reform that uh, the government is planning uh, planning to do uh, but again i think uh, no one of us in this uh, in this region has the the luxury to uh, to give up. Uh, we believe in this way. We believe in uh, having uh, climate justice, having uh, 
better life equality for uh, everyone and equal uh, qualities for uh, uh, for everyone and that's uh, the sustainable future for this uh, for this region it's hard it's not easy at uh, at all we receive uh, threats being a Palestinian I'm, I'm a Palestinian from East Jerusalem managing an Israeli organization I also receive a lot of threats from several people uh, my family receives uh, threats but again this is the way I uh, I believe in this is the sustainable future that I see for my uh, for my kids and uh, again we don't have the luxury to uh, to give up we have to fight for the things that we uh, we believe in and we have to speak uh, louder and louder one of the things that um, that I've heard here from um, friends of ours David and Brenda Jaffe, who are um, enthusiasts for the the bike ride in Israel, um, and this is one of the the support activities uh, and funding activities. Um, could you could you mention just a bit about that? Yeah, actually, this is the <clears throat> the week that I love the most at the Arava Institute, the bike ride the the bike ride week. It's a, it's a bike ride that we conduct every year, and this year's uh, ride will be toward the end of uh, November, if I remember uh, collect, co correctly. It's a, a ride that starts in uh, in Jerusalem, five days. We start in Jerusalem and we go south toward the uh, Ashkelon, the the Negev, Mitzperamon, the Arava. And we arrive to Kibbutz Sektora, and then we ride to uh, to Ilat. It's five days uh, bike ride, very well uh, organized. During the, it's not only a bike ride; it's also a sightseeing. You see the country while you were riding, and all probably like ninety percent of the staff on the ride, they are the alumni of the Arava Institute: Palestinians, Jordanians, Moroccans, internationals. And they serve the they serve the riders, and the the day uh, the riders arrive to uh, Tuktura, they are exposed to the projects that we uh, that we have during the the ride. Every day we have also uh, scientific lectures, lectures from uh, politicians in the in the region. So it's one of the highlights of the of the Arava Institute, and the goal of that is to fund uh, to raise funds for the for the Arava Institute, and we have around like 200 riders every uh, every year. And the registration is still open for the 2023 ride. So if you visit our website, www.arava.org, you will uh, receive more information about the, the ride. So the ride arrives to Kibbutz Ketura, uh, yes. the location of the Arava Institute. And uh, could you comment just a bit? I, I know that you lived on the kibbutz for a time. Um, could you comment a little bit about the relationship between the kibbutz and the and the institute? Yeah. Look, the, the kibbutz was established by Professor Alon Tal, who at the time was a member of Kibbutz Sektura. He was also a Knesset member, and he's now a researcher and professor at Tel Aviv University. We are a non-governmental organization. We are located in Kibbutz Kutura. We are totally independent from the kibbutz. We are not a kibbutz, a kibbutz business. We just buy services from the uh, from the kibbutz. We uh, the students eat in the in the dining room, and this uh, community here in uh, in Kibbutz Kutura is uh, a diverse, very welcoming uh, community. They, uh, they host us uh, and they see us as an education tool for the kids. They tell kids, see, this is the future of the region, the Arava Institute, where people can come and study to, uh, together. When I uh, left the US, Minnesota, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that, and I usually say I came from uh, minus 40 to plus 40 minus 40 centigrade to plus 40 centigrade wow. i i wow. lived in the kibbutz with my with my family and uh, and daughters as a muslim uh, family to live in a kibbutz in the in the desert but we we never felt 
that we are different from the the community. It's such a welcoming community here. You know, the uh, the the change from Minnesota with all the water and all the cold. <laughs> The Negev with the very little water and the heat change is is mind boggling. So, the um, you know we have we have many questions, and um, I think if we can look at some of these. Um, so the first one that I see is um, how do you teach about climate change issues and do you face skepticism? I, I assume the skepticism from the students, from outside people. Okay, it's uh, always you have, uh, you have friends and you have uh, people who are against, uh, against you from both sides, from the Israeli side and from the, the Palestinian side. And sometimes even from the international uh, community, from the BDS. Uh, but again, this is the way that we uh, that we believe in. We see the change on the ground. When I meet the students, when I go see a Bitcoin community that uses one of the technologies that we developed, when I uh, see what our alumni do in the in the region, that makes my day. That what keeps me driving from Jerusalem to the Arava almost uh, 200 miles every every week. Uh, it's the hope, it's the hope that you see, and it's the, the future that you see for this uh, for this region. This, this region deserves a better future than uh, what we have today. You know, a question that comes up um, repeatedly, we, we have from Gloria Bellabalan, from David Jaffe, from others, uh, could you comment on the current political situation, how that's Im impacting the Institute? Okay, look, the, the, the internal uh, politics of, uh, of Israel will impact, uh, will impact everyone. Uh, the judicial uh, reform that the government is, uh, is planning to do it will impact every individual. I, I studied in Turkey. And I lived there for 12 years. I saw Turkey before Erdogan and after Erdogan, and I saw what happened in, uh, in Turkey, what happened to the democracy in Turkey. And if you don't belong to the ruling party, you cannot advance your career to that level. So it impacts really everyone. Even if you want to become a school principal, you cannot. Uh, you have to be associated some somehow with the with the government, uh, it will impact us. It will impact our partnerships, uh, the projects that we have, the advancements that we want to see in the in the region, the regional cooperation, issue, issues related to uh, to area C, the widespread of uh, renewable energies or less uh, or less natural gas, and regarding the the conflict, the new. Uh, the new government, the extreme right uh, political parties in the current Israeli government actually pushes our partners to think twice before they say yes to us. Uh, it impacts our student recruitment, uh, not only in Israel, but also from Jordan, from Israel. It's, uh, the, this government created the kind of instability that uh, partnerships became more, uh, more difficult student recruitment became more uh, uh, more difficult but we're working hard we're working hard with our uh, with our partners we are uh, i'm not exaggerating if i say that we are on a daily basis like communication with our palestinian jordanian and international uh, international partners that's very important to uh, to us there's an impact uh, and i hope the the government decides not to uh, go ahead with that i Trying to, trying to be optimistic. Uh, I'm optimistic also in my uh, in my nature. Uh, yeah, there, there will be a significant impact on uh, on us. Yeah. Um, a, a, another couple of comments, uh, questions here um, about the long term. Do, do you have do you have any measurable way of seeing the kind of impact? 
of the network of alumni um, that that's happening in the region. Uh, I mean, this is a difficult question, I know, but um, the but an interesting one. Can can you measure this in any way? Now, you you you've seen it. You've described it. Uh, some of the projects, uh, the the wastewater treatment that was coming from um, section A to section C, I believe it was. <clears throat> Um, the yeah. water generation in, in Gaza. I mean, there, there are these specific examples. Um, I don't know. Yes, we look for, for the, uh, I'll answer it in, in two parts. The first part is the, the alumni and you see what they do in the, in the region. And you see also the number of uh, students that they come to the Arava Institute because they heard about the, pro the program from the uh, from the alumni you see the <clears throat> the work that the alumni is doing in the in the region the environmental the environmental work and also from our uh, our partners and the projects that we have on the on the ground it's uh, nothing more beautiful than getting a phone call uh, Someone is uh, asking you for help because they heard about the successful projects that you uh, implemented. For example, uh, the success in uh, in Albire, we received many requests from the northern parts of the West Bank. They have similar issues, and the Palestinians, heads of municipalities, calling us and they say, "We heard about your success in Albire. We have similar projects. Can you please help us?" Nothing like to receive a phone call from the Israeli Minister of Defense saying guys we heard about your success in some projects in the in the west bank and we would like to be uh, to be involved it's nothing like to receiving a phone call from the minister of regional cooperation saying please connect me with with someone so it's uh, you see you see the impact uh, and that's uh, really nice yeah um we have a question from marcia torvin on the abraham accords um how have they impacted the the Arava Institute and the work? Um, does it affect the students coming in? Uh, any impact? Yeah. Look, I I just came from uh, Abu Dhabi on uh, on Thursday last uh, last week. I attended the conference also on regional uh, regional cooperation. Abraham Accords is a great opportunity for uh, for us. Again, uh, they they have a similar uh, climate, similar uh, challenges. The technologies that we that we develop here uh, can be easily used in Morocco, United Arab Emirates, and uh, and Bahrain. They have uh, similar issues, and Israel has the right uh, the right technology, the the high tech, the the agri tech, the the green tech, and the Arab Institute again has 25 or 26 years of uh, experience in, uh, in regional cooperation. We signed agreements with Emirati organizations. We already conducting projects with Moroccan uh, with Moroccan partners. We established relationships also with Sudanese uh, researchers, and we received Sudanese uh, students. And uh, I hope that uh, the Abraham Accords expands to to more countries in the in the region. We have a lot of things that they are in in common. We have a common interest here. There, there are a couple of questions um, from different people about about the students, about selecting the students. Um, how do they identify? How do they get in touch with you? Uh, what's the common language once everyone's there? Um, if you could comment on that. Yeah, uh, the uh, programs, uh, the programs in English. Uh, we have a recruitment team in uh, in Jordan. In Palestine, in Israel, and we have university relations manager in uh, in Boston, in the uh, in the U.S. We through these people we recruit our uh, students. Every student is interviewed at least uh, two times to check the English level, their environmental uh, interest, and their future impact. Because this is what we want to do. We want to have students here that they have a kind of uh, leadership and that leadership is is shaped here when they come to the to the Arava Institute because we want to have an impact in the uh, in the region and we say yes probably to like 60 
percent of the of the applicants yeah another question comes up um which um is an interesting one um and and the question is really about problem areas what are the uh problem areas that the institute has encountered either in terms of research and technology or in terms of student collaboration and um how how have you dealt with those yeah, look <clears throat> we the the Adama institute really managed to uh, build a nice credit in this uh, in this region we are not anymore the uh, the best kept uh, secret uh, but again we are a non-governmental organization and our resources are uh, are limited we want to have a larger impact on the region that's why we decided to expand the campus of the Arava Institute we have a capacity for 62 students we want to grow to 150 in two phases oh. and we are in uh, the stage of a capital campaign to fundraise for the expansion of the of the campus, a campus that will have a gold lead standard, the first of its kind in uh, southern Israel, and actually I call it a living lab, where it's a building that produces the drinking water, treats the wastewater, has hydroponics, to produce its own electricity, desalinate the water, and students will live in such a campus where they use and learn these technologies. And when they go back to their communities, they will apply these, these technologies. It's a, it's a regional hub for, for climate change, where all researchers that deal with climate change come to, to Israel, to the, to the Arava Institute with labs, uh, guest house, uh, large auditoriums. And this is our main, uh, main challenge now. It's to have to find the, the resources to enlarge our impact in the region. The, you mentioned before that the, the website is arava.org and um, I would encourage people, I think um, I've received a number of messages, both on the, literally on the phone while we're, we've been talking and, uh, and of course I hear it through the Q&A. Um, where people are are fascinated about this program, and um, and of course it is one of the programs of hope, and promise, and trust in the Middle Eastern region, and uh, we thank you so much for the the leadership that you're providing in this program, and uh, thank you for being with us today on the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, I would strongly encourage people. Uh, we we have some additional um, uh, film footage on the uh, uh, Jewish Learning Channel about the Arava Institute. Go to the uh, the website itself, arava.org, and uh, find out more about these programs. And um, Tariq, I want to thank you today for being here and walking us through this information about the Institute and its research. Sure. It's my it's my pleasure. I really thank you for uh, for having me. It's uh, it was an honor. Please feel free to share my email with the with the participants, and I will be more than happy to answer any questions. And thank you again for this honor. Um, that's uh, thank you for your participation and helping us understand more in detail and have more knowledge about this program. Thanks a lot. Thank you.